Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Ronald Bailey, the science correspondent for Reason Magazine and Reason.com, and the author of the new book, The End of Doom, Environmental Renewal in the 21st Century. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Ron. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you for having me on. In the beginning of your book, you, you start off with a, a character, um, maybe that's the right word, a character, a person who kind of fits into the general thrust of your book, Paul Ehrlich, um, and you talk about a, a conversation you had with him when you were writing a, a an earlier book. An earlier book about prognostications. But for those of our listeners who don't know, who is Paul Ehrlich and uh, and why does he sort of fit into the theme of your book? Paul Ehrlich uh, has been a figure in uh, environmental circles for all, almost 50 years at this point. He was, he's actually an entomologist who works at Stanford University. But he's most famous for having written a book called The Population Bomb in 1968. It sold uh, almost 10 million copies around the world at the time. And in that book, he, he, in 68, he said um, – Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death in the 1970s despite any crash programs that could be embarked upon now, period. There was no qualifications. It's just going to happen. In 1970, he wrote an article where he basically said, well, the famines are coming. I think the only thing I can do is uh, my friends and I must retreat to the mountains and take care of ourselves. Well, in the fullness of time, as we've seen, that didn't happen. And uh, may, may I tell the story how I came to write the Please. book? Yeah. Um, when I was in college back in the 1970s, that long ago, I was taught the population bomb, a bomb among other things. I was also taught The Limits to Growth, which was published the year I entered college in 1972, which basically said we were going to run out of all kinds of vital minerals and, and uh, oil and gas by the 2000s. And of course, in the early 60s, uh, Silent Spring had been published by uh, uh, Rachel Carson, where among other things, she claimed that uh, our exposure to synthetic chemicals was going to cause massive cancer epidemics. So basically my professors were teaching me that my life was going to be short and miserable and the world was going to hell. Uh, Twenty years later, I was working as a staff writer at Forbes magazine and I noticed that we were still here. And I noticed not only that, that we were richer and people were living longer and there were a lot of very, a lot of very good things going on. Pollution levels were way down in the United States. So I went to my editor and said I'd like to go back and reread the books and then go to the people who wrote them and ask them well, what happened. And I rather naively expected them to go, well, thank goodness we were wrong. No, that's not what happened. For example, Paul Ehrlich, when I was interviewing him in 1990, said, all right, Ron, I admit it. I got my timing wrong. The famines will occur in the future. And I go, so when do you expect them to occur now? And he confidently told me in 1990 that they're going to occur between the year 2000 and 2010. It is now 2015 and it's still no famines. I went to the people at MIT who had done the uh, computer program for the limits to growth models and sat with them all day and they're very friendly. We had a very good conversation. But I went – kept going back to the table in the center of the book saying, well, you said this was all going to be gone by such and so. And finally one of them turned to me and goes, all right, Ron, I admit it. We probably overemphasized the material resources side too much. I'm going, OK, fine. Have you called up the New York Times and tell, told them that? They had your, your uh, book on the front page of their newspaper. And I couldn't talk to Rachel Carson but uh, fortunately, Ehrlich had also outlined a, a uh, scenario in which uh, people would be dying of cancer at such a great rate that the average life expectancy in the United States would be 45 years by the year 1980 because of 45? cancer. 45? So 40. back to about, what, 1890 levels? <laughs> Basically. So because of cancer, though, in this particular case and because we're being exposed to synthetic chemicals. Obviously, that hasn't happened. Every year since, the average life expectancy of Americans has gone up. The more chemicals, the longer we live. Hmm. Was this because Ehrlich and Carson and their elk scared us into action? That no. if it weren't for their warnings? No, not at all. Um, the what it's interesting. Let's, do, let's look at what population is and why is, what the trends are. In the book, I point out the demographers are basically looking to, uh, through the rest of the century that the, the trends are likely that world population will top out between eight and nine billion toward the middle of the century and start declining at that point. Why would that be happening? Largely because women are going to be having fewer children because they're going to be more liberated. They'll be more living in cities. They'll be more educated. They will be participating in the market economies. Frankly, they'll have other things to do than sitting around home having babies. 
And there was a fascinating correlation that uh, some wonderful social anthropologists came up with with regard to life expectancy and the number of children and women have over the course of their lifetime. If you expect to live under uh, – if your life expectancy is under age 50 and there are unfortunately several countries in the world where that is the case, you have five to six children. Why? Because first of all, you don't expect a lot of them to live very long. Two, you're living in a very poor place. So the more children you have, the more resources your family might gather up, that kind of thing. But then what happens is as life expectancy increases, in other words, as more wealth goes into society, as women become more educated, from 50 to 60, it goes down to three children. From 60 to 70, it goes down to 2.5. And from 75, from 70 to 75, it goes down to 1.7. All – every – Rich country in the world, there are 80 countries in the world now that are rich enough where, uh, life ex- uh, where life expectancy for women is sufficiently high that the average number of children they have is under two. Which makes it below replacement Which rates. makes it below replacement. So assuming that – and I do not – I do believe this will be happening. As the world becomes richer and more prosperous and new technologies come along and women are more educated, we are going to see women choosing to have fewer children and so world population will peak and start to decline. And that's a great part of liberty. I mean people are getting to choose the number of children they want to have. So when people like Ehrlich and he certainly is not the first to make predictions of catastrophe and then revise them and revise them and revise them. Also, uh, also Christians, that's a very common religious prediction too. So not just uh, environmentalists. When, when they do this or when he tells you, oh no, I was a little bit wrong and it's now going to be in this decade. Um, What's the motivation behind that? I mean is he saying – there's, there's got to be a little bit of just professional pride and like if I admit I was wrong, you know, but I can always keep pushing it off to the future and the future never actually arrives and so if I keep saying it long enough. Um, but so is, is that some of the motivation or is there – does he genuinely believe this and this is – I mean of course asking you to psychologize which sure. can't be done accurately. But um, does he genuinely believe it and does he have good reason at least – to to continue to believe it or at least plausible reasons or is it just kind of transparently, you know, I don't want to look like a fool? Actually, I think he has his reasons. Uh, I, sh- I should mention that as recently as this past year, he was asked how likely it is that human civilization will survive. This century, he said less than 10 percent chance. So he's still out there saying it's all over. But his particular – I think the problem is he's enthralled to a particular theory. And it was a theory that was devised by a guy named Malthus, an economist back in the late 18th century um, where he basically was arguing that the population of all human, of humans was regulated by the food supply. And his argument was is that population pressure would always outstrip our ability to produce more food. And up until actually that century, that was the case. Human uh, science and technology and ingenuity had not come along to be able to produce more food over that time. But what was interesting about it is – and a lot of these people were talking about Ehrlich was one of these, a biologist. Uh, Charles Darwin took that theory and it works for animals. It works uh, for animals brilliantly. Their populations are related to the food supply. In fact, one way to think about it is that every species except human beings is – the whole goal is to turn food more food into more offspring. The more food, the more offspring. Humans don't do that. And the problem is, is that Ehrlich wants to apply that biological theory to a creative uh, species that can use and use its freedom to choose other choices and he just can't see that he's wrong, that it do- that particular theory does not apply to us. So he is enthralled to a theory. Does it seem sometimes – this is kind of dovetailing off Aaron's question – and I actually think this about about doomsayers of all types, including sometimes Christians, that people like Paul Ehrlich and other Malthusians and other doomsayers, it seems that part of them almost wants it to yes. become true because they'll be vindicated as being correct, which is sort of perverse. Well, I, I don't know that they want to be vindicated so much. Though there, I'm sure there must be some of that there. But there's a there's a, and I do talk about this a bit in the book. There's an attraction to millenarianism. There's this notion that my generation is at the hinge point of history. What we do matters crucially for all time, much more important than any previous generation. And as a baby boomer, I completely agree with that. But <laughs> um, yes, the real baby, me generation, right, right? I mean, <laughs> baby boomers are the most important generation in history ever, and we continue <laughs> to stay that way. 
Uh, but no, and I hate to say it, but a lot of this uh, doom and gloom stuff is a baby boomer phenomenon, dare I admit to it. But, uh, but there, there is that attraction. We, you see that in all kinds of religious millinery movements as well. And environmentalism has adopted that very largely. I see it also as uh, the underlying ideology, which we can get into more about what that is. But when you make a prediction about some sort of catastrophe that is often based off of the idea that right now we're doing things incorrectly. So it's really a critique about now. Uh, right. There is some sort of fatal flaw in the way that we're behaving. We're not behaving authentically human. Um, and you could say you could say with Christians, you could say with some Marxism right. uh, back in the and that therefore there will be a come up and a day of reckoning that will show us the error of our ways. So listen to me now is kind of is kind of the thing. But it's interesting the overpopulation thing, which which I do think, which I remember hearing growing up. I mean, I think Aaron probably. Remembers that, like, and but but I don't hear about it as much anymore. No, it's 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 receded into the background. Though, if you follow the debates, it is still in the background always, in in the context of of still resource usage and and particularly climate change. The fewer people, the less warm the planet will be. Now, moving on, because the the book is is full of, I highly suggest it. It's it's full of a lot of different areas, but you also talk about. Peak oil, oh, yes. which is something something that I used to hear about a, a lot too. I think uh, only, 10 years only ago. ten years ago, yes. yes, that was supposed to be the peak. Um, and occasionally you'll hear about it. But what it, what is peak oil? What was the original concept? How are they updating it? Uh, I've been through three peak oil fears in the course of my life so far. Um, the idea is by a geologist, by a guy named Hubbard in the 1950s, where he basically said that oil fields, once you produce about half of what you can get out of it, it starts to decline steeply. And he predicted that uh, U.S. oil production would peak in the early 1970s and it did basically. He was, he was right about that. But he was all wrong about the technology and economics as it turns out. So on the most recent one, my, my favorite prediction uh, was, in two th was by uh, a geologist who wrote a book called Hubbard's Peak named Kent Davies who is at uh, Princeton University where he said, the production of oil on planet Earth will peak on Thanksgiving Day 2005. Well, I happened to look it up. The world produced 85 million barrels per day in 1985 in, – in, in 2005, 85 million barrels in 2005. And as of last week, the world was producing 95 million barrels per day. So we got nowhere near the peak at that point. And now the projections are – that we're going to be able to produce at least 110 to 120 million barrels per day. And of course, for people who are worried about climate change, that's bad news. But isn't there – I mean the math seems to support that there will be a peak oil at some point. We, I mean we consume a lot of oil and oil takes a long time to make more of and so at some point we're going to run out. Uh, I think that we will be I, – I understand, yes. Obviously, it is a limited supply of some sort. The problem is the supply is limited by our technology. Uh, if we had retained the same technology that we had producing oil in 1975, we've, we would have already peaked. There would have been no question about that. But then we had this wonderful new revolution in fracking and horizontal drilling and all of a sudden it unlocked a huge supply of oil that will probably last for another 30, 40 years at least. This seems to be in a lot of environmental issues. So we – I mean it came up with a talk of the population. It comes with peak oil. But like assume that technology is static. Assume that culture is static, which seems on the one hand a very odd assumption because we have human history to look at and see that it most certainly is not. But also is potentially I guess a little bit understandable because imagining how things will be different in the future is – very hard um, and and our big predictions – I was – saw something on Twitter, a line about how um, science fiction authors, a lot of them predicted the moon landing but none of them predicted that it would be televised. <laughs> um, so it just yes. – is, is how much of this doom and gloom is driven by this just bad ability we have for predicting the future. Oh, my species is terrible. We, do, we are just terrible at forecasting. We, we have no ability to prophesy whatsoever. What The amazing thing is that we developed in the Western world uh, two – well, three institutions that underlie our society. This was outlined by uh, 
uh, uh, Jonathan Rauch uh, 20 years ago. A brilliant idea was that uh, capitalism is how we decide who gets what. Democracy is how we decide who wields power. And liberal science is how we discern what the truth is, how we figure out what is true. So – but two of those institutions are – information gathering institutions by excellent markets are perfect institutions for marshalling and supplying information and getting it to the right person at the right time. And these biologists and ecologists have no view of that. They, do, they do not understand markets as information collecting and dispersion devices. And that's – and because we have that device, coupled now with scientific research, that a, mes- a method of figuring out when something is the case, we, we have no idea what the new technologies are going to be. We're, our forecast will always be wrong and there will always, in my humble opinion, be way short of what will uh, eventually occur. I want to go back uh, to the question that Aaron asked because I think it's important the it, oil and other things are finite. And when I have discussions with environmentally conscious people, I mean I'm environmentally conscious but of sure. the kind that we're talking about. I've uh, just been accused by a national review of both being a libertarian and an environmentalist and that's a problem. <laughs> but anyway. Every time I, I had this conversation where you know, I talk about technology and I say all these things. Well, we, we don't know how much oil there is or how much we can take out or zinc or name your name sure. your thing. But they say but, – but it is limited. It is limited. You can't deny that. We will run out of oil. We will run out of zinc. I mean that's I – mean, I mean on a basic level, if we use it all um, and so – and I say, OK, yes, I admit that. Like, well, then why do you want to keep going and just cannibalizing the Earth's resources? What about – Sustainable development is the big watchword, but right. but this this seems to under it's like the the very baseline assumption that that because it is it is a finite resource we have to figure out a better way of not using it. But it, but a resource what is a resource? Take a, a take a copper rock. You gave you give me a rock with copper in it. What can I do? I could crack a nut with it, or I could throw it at somebody. What that is not a resource to me. It's a rock. What you take is the elaboration of someone and markets and, and technologists to, is to spend thousands of years figuring out how to get the copper purified, refined, shaped, shift, you know, alloyed, whatever you want to do to make it into parts of a computer chip. That's a resource is basically what your mind can do with something. It is not just the stuff. We don't get richer because we keep doing the same recipe. We get richer because we make better recipes and we are slowly but surely dematerializing the economy. We are using less and less stuff to get more and more value all the time. I, I give an indica- – I talk to um, – I, I discuss some work done by Vaslov Smil, for example, the polymath out of Saskatchewan of all places. But anyway, who basically says that the if you did pound per pound, it took uh, – Basically, one pound to get uh, of material to get I don't know a dollar's worth of, of of value. Now it takes a quarter of a pound to get a dollar's worth of value of just any random material you want. We're using less and less stuff to get more and more value all the time. But Smeal, I have a quote from him uh, okay. that I made a note of, which which I, I guess is pretty much the same question. But it is what you hear all the time. He says. The pursuit of endless growth is obviously an unsustainable strategy. And that's because that's I don't a common think, thing. I know, but I think that he doesn't understand what growth means in this sense. We don't. What we want is light and heat and food, and so we don't. We we don't want to have more candles. We don't want to have more horse-drawn carriages. We want to have other kinds of transportation. And I, I take on Smeal actually on that direct quote in the book where I'm pointing out. One – and I'm not prophesying but I'm suggesting one of the ways that we could overcome a lot of material usage is, is moving to a fleet of, of uh, self-driving uh, electric cars. And there have been wonderful simulations were done. Basically, we could reduce the size of the world's transportation fleet uh, from what it is now and supply enough transportation for everybody on planet Earth, 9, 9 billion people using a fleet that's smaller than the one we have now powered by electricity and people would have to wait on average 15 seconds for a car to show up. That would be dematerialization of a huge sort. And I can't elaborate all of the other ways that the world is going to go this way. Another way I think about it is energy use. Uh, If we had asked Einstein and Edison and Madame Curie to sit around in 1900 and go, so what will people be using and for energy and how much will they be using in 2015? These are the smartest people on the planet. There is no way. I mean the, the, the 
radio hadn't been invented <laughs> at that point. Podcasts hadn't been invented. Computers, air conditioners, refrigerators, tel- airplane, on and on and on. They would have no clue. We are in exactly the same relationship to generations in 2100 with regard to what they will be using. But and, yes, but even if – or even unless we can drive, say, our efficiency at manufacturing computer chips to the point where they – use zero copper, don't we have some obligation to leave some of those copper rocks alone rather than – for future generations rather than putting them all in our own iPhones? No. Our, our obligation is to do what our ancestors did, which is to make a more prosperous, richer, uh, more knowledge-intensive world because that gives them the resources and the ability to figure out what it is that they want to do much more easily than if they remain poor. I mean th- if – should our – very poor great grandparents have not used up resources so that we would be able to use them no instead what they did was create a world that was much richer with possibilities and and material things that we're getting to enjoy and that is our obligation to future generations to do exactly the same thing what does the term sustainable development mean to you because I, I hear it an awful lot and, and I've been trying to – Well, I don't want ways. unsustainable development. I, I, Who does? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it like is it, I, we don't use anything or we put – I mean I, it, I think it's like a word you know, like social justice. You just throw it on because it sounds nice. I, I suppose I, – I, I, I talk again about what this concept might mean of sustainable. The, the, the plain fact of the matter is that all prior societies to democratic capitalist one that we live in were unsustainable. They all collapsed at some point or other. And if we're not sustainable, I don't know who – or there are no examples of another sustainable society. And I, I actually believe that we will be that society again because of the harnessing of human ingenuity to solve problems as they arise. We cannot figure out what all the problems are going to be. What human beings do is learn from failure. We do not learn from success and so there will be failures but we will learn from them and the more resources that we have, the more knowledge we have, the more likely we are to solve them. But should we proceed with caution no. in that? <laughs> I mean, so, so, I mean it's, not just, it's not just that like say when we – of course. Turn these copper rocks into copper for our computer chips that we're using up the copper. But doing that has negative externalities, sure. pollution, and it may have things we aren't even aware of. And so how much should we factor those kinds of things into our thinking about the future? Are you thinking about the precautionary principle? Something, sure. Something like that, yes. There well, are real possible cataclysmic effects for some of these things. There – and, and, and exactly. It is the case that running the super collider over in France, you might create strangelets and the entire planet will be sucked into a black hole instantly. Uh, the, I can't guarantee there will be no catastrophic effects by, by technology. I mean a nuclear war would be a very bad thing. Uh, but the bombs don't go off by themselves in that particular case. I think it would be really hard put to find – a side effect of an industrial process that would lead to anything like the catastrophe of a nuclear war, for example. But the precautionary principle you mentioned, um, you which do, I like you, to summarize as never do anything for the first time. <laughs> exactly, and you do a very good job of explaining how it is really incoherent. And yes. I mean, people like Cass Sunstein have said this is incoherent, and it actually often reminds me of uh, Pascal's wager in the sense of you're supposed to do. Something to appease or get, have a possible infinite reward or an infinite punishment, but there's a non-zero chance that almost anything could give you an infinite reward or infinite punishment or inaction. So precautionary principle right, to right. inaction: if you don't do it, this is a huge problem. So do you just regard it as sort of a non-starter? It's a complete non-starter. The, the fact of the matter is, is that what we're doing, what it advises us to do ultimately, is to stick with old technologies rather than try new technologies. And we know that that doesn't that recipe doesn't work. How do we know that? Is because we, as we switch to better and better technologies over time, we've gotten richer, we've gotten healthier, we have longer lives, we have a, less disability, we have less disease. So we know for a fact that our process of using markets and human ingenuity through science are having vastly more beneficial effects than than deleterious effects. And the precautionary principle applied to say building a coal plant. Uh, instead of burning wood, 
uh, that would have been catastrophic because it would have been absolutely wood is catastrophic. Horrible for or, wood. or if, it, but if they're trying to apply it to genetically modified crops, which would also be catastrophic in the sense that you're pre- preventing people from developing a technology that uh, so intensifies agriculture that you can leave forests standing, that you can use less farmland. In fact, we are probably at peak farmland now and, and if Jesse Osborne at Rockefeller University is right, uh, by 2060, an area the, the size – double the size of, of the United States east of the Mississippi will be returned to nature. You mentioned Rachel Carson uh, a few minutes ago, uh, which I think was worth going back to or at least who she is. And you kind of identify her as, as maybe the founding mother of modern environmental movement. Uh, who, who was she and, and how was she so instrumental in, in the way environmentalism is practiced now? Uh, Rachel Carson uh, was a U.S. government uh, scientist. Uh, she wrote a book called Silent Spring. She was extremely concerned uh, particularly about the use of pesticides uh, in agriculture and the harm that they were causing to wildlife. And uh, so in that book, her particular – the chemical she particularly disliked was called DDT. And DDT uh, had been developed as a pesticide. It was a kind of a miracle uh, uh, chemical in the sense that it really uh, more or less eliminated malaria, including in the United States. People don't remember this, but up until the early 1950s, uh, malaria was endemic to the southern states of the United States. And DDT applied uh, to uh, the, the breeding places of mosquitoes, plus screens, of course, uh, finally eliminated malaria. And, say, and by using this chemical, saved literally tens of millions of people's lives. On the other hand, uh, she was right to point out, as it turns out, that using the chemical as a widespread uh, insecticide in crops probably was harming uh, raptors, most particularly eagles, ospreys, brown pelicans, for example, and because what happened is the chemical in some way was causing their egg shells to be thin and then they would crack and they would, uh, the population uh, was plummeting. So – she was probably right that, that it, it had to be brained back as an agricultural chemical. But the other thing, she really, she did recognize that a lot of people in suburban United States wouldn't care very much about this. So the thing that she was really on to was, well, these chemicals are going to cause an epidemic of cancer. And uh, she would say – and she had anecdotes like there was a guy who was very embarrassed. He had spiders in his garage and so he sprayed it one day and three weeks later, he came down with aplastic anemia. Uh, another case, uh, a woman came down with a brain tumor and she just used these anecdotes. And it, in a certain sense in the 1950s, cancer was very mysterious and I'm not accusing her of bad faith. But most cancer doctors would go, you're crazy now. What we do now know, in fact, the American Cancer Society every year puts out a nice report and uh, every year they point out that uh, exposure to chemicals, quote, chemicals, both natural and synthetic, are responsible for between 2 and maybe 4 percent of all cancers. It, it doesn't say they can't cause cancer but the reason you have cancer is because you eat too much, you drink too much, you smoke too much, you don't go to the gym enough. Uh, basically, it's lifestyles. It's not chemicals. And how much is just age? I mean an aging population. Oh, yeah, all the, people die somehow. Right. The, uh, basically, um, I, I can't recall off the top of my head, but something like 65 percent of all cancers occur in people over age 55. Again, as a cancer researcher once told me, Ron, if you live long enough, you will get cancer. Now, Rachel Carson, you also identify as kind of the spiritual core. The, the, like you political. mentioned the, the, the political and with a with an idea of kind of natural is good. The beginning right. of of I'm, I don't know if spiritualism is the right term, but some sort of uh, idea about the environment and a sort of poetic appreciation for natural over artificial, which which kind of gets inaugurated by Rachel Carson and then the 60s movement and things like that. Would, would you agree? Does that become kind of – it sort of takes on the religious tones maybe. Walt Whitman beat her to it. Have. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, yes. I, I, she was – Again, I think part of what was happening was there was a part – you know, the United States was rapidly industrializing and there was higher pollution levels and so forth. And we were just getting at that point, which I will call the environmental transition or the environmental Kuznetsk curve, where 
the idea is is that as countries get begin the process of industrialization, more pollution occurs. Uh, the air gets dirtier, the water gets dirtier because people are more anxious to get some of the good things of life, some of the new refrigerators, cars, get good jobs for their children, get educations, that kind of thing, build bigger houses. But then they – but then the 1950s when Carson was coming along, people began to go, this is – you know, the air is really filthy. I can't go swimming in the Potomac. I'll tell you a story about that in a little bit. But anyway – and so when people get to a certain level of affluence, they start to demand a cleaner environment. And uh, that was what was happening when Rachel Carson was there. So she was in a certain way, I think, expressing the zeitgeist. But she also didn't understand the process that once again, it was the creation of wealth and technology that was going to enable the cleanup of the environment that she treasured. Now, how much did the uh, cleanup – I mean I remember – Growing up in Denver, that the the smog cloud was pretty big in the eighties, and and uh, we have like the Cuyahoga River fire, a very famous story. How much of that should the government stand up and say, "Well, we did this. We put in air quality mandates, and we we cleaned up the rivers, and we put all these mandates in." It, it's quite controversial. One of the things, and you probably know this, is is that when you're looking at air pollution trends in the United States before the existence of the uh, uh, Clean Air Act. It, there was no change in inflection. It was just increasing. But that being said, we have to admit that – and I'll make this statement. Wherever you see anywhere in the world what you think is an environmental problem, whatever you think it is, I don't care what it is, it is occurring in an open access commons. It is, hope, it is occurring in property or in places that nobody owns it. And the air is like that or the or because of the way our property laws work in the United States, rivers, lakes, estuaries are like that. No one owns them. So everybody dumps them. This is why you see trash on the side of the road instead of in people's yards. Uh, and so there are two things you can do with the commons. You can privatize them, which would be my preference, or you can regulate them. Unfortunately, we chose to regulate them and I think that probably cost more to get the environmental quality than we would otherwise have had. But it would be wrong to say that it didn't help. Now, you also write about GMOs in the book, which um, I mean, I don't know what is the most controversial chapter in the book, and the global warming one is probably controversial enough. But the GMO thing is just more and more prominent. It feels constantly. like that. It's it's the current panic attack after peak oil seems to have slipped a bit from the country. Yeah, maybe they just need a new one every ten years or something. But the GMO crowd uh, is GMO is going to kill us all with Franken foods, or is there nothing to be worried about? Every independent scientific organization on planet Earth that has ever evaluated these modern biotech crops, the current versions of them, that includes the American Medical Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, it includes the European Food Safety Administration, for God's sake. All of them have found them completely safe for humans to eat and safe for the environment. No one on planet Earth has gotten so much as a cough, wheeze, sniffle, bellyache from eating any ingredients made from biotech crops, period. How are genetically modified organisms different if they're different from cross-breeding or selective breeding? Because so, one, of the, one of the comebacks when people criticize GMOs is to say, well, we've always been doing that. What do you think you know, corn or bananas used to look like? Are they the same thing? Is that a, is that a fair comeback or not? Actually, um, uh, genetically modified crops are much more precisely made. You know exactly what's going on with them. When you're breeding particularly wide crosses between various uh, uh, plant species, for example, you don't know what's going on, what genes are going where. One of my favorite ways of, of making a lot of organic crops, and these are approved organic crops, is called chemical and radiation mutagenesis. The, what happened in the early part of the 20th century is that a lot of biologists were going, why don't we take these crops that we, we have here and we'll just irradiate them? Or we'll, uh, we'll mutate them using chemicals. We'll plant the seeds and see what comes up. And if we like something, then we'll start crossbreeding it. So basically, they were rearranging thousands of genes, thousands of genes, and then crossbreeding them with conventional plants. And a lot of the organic plants that are approved are, were made exactly this way, which is not to say it's not safe because as far as we can tell, nobody suffered any problems from this. But if that wasn't dangerous – Think about changing one or two genes and how safe that would be and that's what genetic, modern biotech genetic modification does. It changes one or two genes, not thousands of genes. But it seems, that seems kind of mad scientist in its own way. We, 
we massively irradiate with unpredictable effects and knocking DNA off of different things and then see what happens. Isn't that the concern that, we're, that this stuff is going to get out? The ecosystem is a sort of carefully balanced uh, or, you know, or organic structure, spontaneous order that if you throw something in there, a corn, that it's like an invasive species, right? You, when rabbits went to Australia, they completely – green snakes, all these sort of invasive species. So what we don't really know. So we need to at least have something in place to make sure this stuff doesn't get out. Or if nothing else, if we're not going to release a zombie apocalypse you know, uh, disease out there that escapes from these mad scientist experiments. With regard to diseases, we'll set that aside for the moment. But uh, the thing about crop plants, why do we put them in fences? Why do we till and so forth? Uh, no one seems to be worried about wheat plants taking over a forest or corn escaping onto your lawn and taking over. It's because basically crop plants can't live without us protecting them. That's why we use pesticides. This is why we do these things. They are not a problem in that regard. If we could get them to be perennial and grow and so forth, that would probably be a great thing. But as it turns out, crop plants are almost defenseless and we made them defenseless because it turns out if you're defenseless, you're a lot tastier. <laughs> so who, in the, you know, the, who is more anti-science, the left or the right on these? Uh, it, it is a general rule because the left is very anti-GMO, the right's not so good on global warming uh, or is it just a toss-up? I'm, I'm close to a toss-up when I go at it, frankly. The problem is, is that science in – in a modern secular society, what has happened is, is that uh, a lot of the authorities that people used to trust, their preachers, their politicians, their potentates of various sort, you know, the corporate leaders, it, it turned out they weren't all that trustworthy and we're very cynical about them. So what is left standing as a way of trying to determine what the, the true things are and that is science. And so whenever a, a new issue comes up, the first thing that people do, partisans do, is rush to claim science is on my side. And they, they – we're really, really adept and in fact the more – the better you are at understanding scientific information, the faster you can go find the stuff you want to prove your point. And it's a great disservice to both the policy process but it's a huge disservice to the only institution that we know how to find out what the truth is and that is science. How much of this modern environmentalism is signaling? Yeah. Because I'm struck by there's no evidence that GMOs are harmful and there hasn't been so it's not necessarily clear why we would all of a sudden start caring about them. Um, the, the trend lines for population seem to completely contradict the doomsayers. The stuff we talked about with cancer rates that just seem to completely go against it. So it's not like – it's not like you know, there's – oh, there's solid evidence on both sides and this is a fuzzy issue. Um, but, but it's always striking how many of these things, the solution seems to be what you now – because these are catastrophes that you have an obligation to prevent. Um, what you now are morally obligated to do is to some way either restrict what you're doing or – and or spend more money. So organic non-GMO food or whatever is typically more expensive. Um, and then on top of that, it seems you have a moral obligation to tell everyone that you're doing it and make sure they know. So you drive the car that says hybrid or whatever else. Um, so how much of this is just simply cultural feedback loops and people wanting to appear like they really, really care to their neighbors? Uh, most of it, unfortunately. Um, I, I think that people are very sincere about what they think but there really is, as you say, a lot of signaling. It says I am a good person. You, you can trust me because I believe all this other stuff. And it works for both the right and the left for signaling. Um, fortunately, as a libertarian, we don't need to signal. We just need to tell the truth and then we're OK. <laughs> yes, we don't signal at all. It's no, fine. No, well, exactly. that, that I think raises that. the obvious <laughs> question of um, you said the more adept you get at understanding the science, um, the easier it is for you to go out and find the data that agrees with you. And so is your book just a fat stack of data that agrees with you? Uh, good question. I, I do address that actually in, in, in the introduction of the book. Um, what I've tried to do is to stay away from anything that would be considered controversial. I use only peer-reviewed science published in, in reputable journals, government reports, international reports, reports from reputable think tanks, uh, some of even Cato. 
but I'm very clear signposting the data that I'm using and I, uh, I've already seen complaints going, too much data. But my point is, is I don't want to cherry – I don't want to ever be accused of cherry picking. But I also say, look, up front, I'm a libertarian uh, and you should take that into account when you read my book. But you should also take into account your own tendencies to conf confirmation bias when you read it. And that's what's a, a thing you mentioned a few times in the book is the Yale Cultural Cognition uh, Project, yes. which is, uh, has shown that what people believe about scientific issues is chiefly determined by their cultural values. And it makes me the, – the, the uh, thing that always strikes me when I think about environmental issues, especially global warming, which we can turn to now, uh, which I pretty much – try to have no opinions on or that are scientific because I'm not a scientist, which is a rare thing. But it, a lot of the people who talk about global warming, not everyone, the catastrophists, um, it's, it's really anti-capitalism. Uh, in, in it, they're talking about policy prescriptions that they would believe anyway. in the absence of global right, warming. I mean right. Naomi Klein – Whatever the problem is, the solution is always socialism. Exactly. Naomi Klein is not, did not become an a extreme – let's call her a socialist or I don't know if that's accurate but a very, very mm -hmm. left-wing person uh, you know, because of global warming. She saw global warming and seems to be like, oh, well, this is like the reason why we have to undercut the capitalist system right. because it just consumes and consumes and consumes and destroys the world. So in terms of global warming, um, do, you, do you see that as a lot of it being just anti-capitalism? Yes, <laughs> I do. Um, let, let, let's talk about Naomi Klein. She wrote a book last year called This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. So I mean she's putting it right out there what she's up to. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't put words in her mouth. No, That's exactly what she she's says. She's absolutely yeah. said it. Um, and uh, she, she's in favor of, uh, of small decentralized solutions supposedly. And yet it's very amusing because she's uh, also in favor of uh, a plan that was devised by two economists at uh, universities in California, a guy named Jacobson and another guy named DeLucci where uh, from 2015 to 2030, you could transform the entire energy system of the world from off of fossil fuels into entirely renewables, supposedly. And she's – and she's – I've seen her on various media going, this is it. We, we have the plan. We know how to do it. And so I actually reviewed the plan and got, went through it. The plan would cost $100 trillion. <laughs> it would be $100 trillion over the next 15 years. That would be 11 percent of the entire world's output for every year for the next 15 years. It would require building 6,300 megawatt solar plants per year. Per six, six, 6,300 per year. 6,300 megawatt plants oh, per okay, year. Okay. I should point out that that is – in a year's worth, that is also 10 times more than all the solar panels on planet Earth currently. So imagine – and then it would also require building a quarter of a million new wind turbines per year for the next 15 years. There are only 225,000 wind turbines on planet Earth currently. So this is a feasible plan. I, I, I think we could do it but I don't think it's a delightfully decentralized community-based plan. I think it is a top-down, centralized, horrific – if you will, corporate a scheme, but anyway. Well, she if she's a catastrophist, I mean, if 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 the catastrophe is big enough, which which I want to ask you, what, what is the likelihood of catastrophe? But if if it's like an asteroid, sure. If we found out if it were ten like years from now, there's an asteroid. Sure, it's like sure, the sure. entire productive capacity of the Earth has to be turned into just this, fixing the asteroid problem. We're like, oh yes, we should. It doesn't, right, matter, right. doesn't matter how much it costs. Um, so the, on the catastrophe side, global warming. Uh, is it a problem it and is. what should we do about it? It is a problem. Uh, I, I used to think it wasn't and I changed my mind sometime around 2005. And the way I would like to think of it is it's a balance of the evidence for me is that it's a problem. It, it will grow to be a problem by the end of the century. It is not a slam dunk. It is not a beyond reasonable doubt uh, analysis of the data. Uh, part of the reason I think so is, is that the planet has been warming uh, since 1950. It's gone up uh, basically a degree centigrade, about 1.6 degrees on average. The, uh, what you also see is sea ice has been melting for the last three decades. Glaciers all around the world have been receding, all 130,000 of them practically. Uh, there was a, the uh, temperature difference between night and day has been – Shifting uh, spring and fall – spring is earlier, fall is later all around the world. Uh, the oceans are warming. I mean all of these things 
Now, they could be coincidences, but they're all happening at the same time we've loaded up the atmosphere with extra carbon dioxide from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million now. It could be a coincidence. I don't think so. But I trust me, as a good libertarian, I would love the problem to go away. Uh, we'd save a lot of, uh, of, uh, of changes in the economy and, the, and energy shifts that we're going to be making. But I do think it is a problem. Is it an asteroid-style catastrophe? Probably not. Um, we have a, at least till the end of the century, I think, to solve it. And I think we're already well on the way to doing it. What does solving it look like? Is that something where – is this one of these instances where we need the state? Is this a tragedy of the commons kind of issue I think there's a bit of a step up? I think there is a, a tragedy of the commons uh, portion to it and there are various ways you could do it. Um, probably I, the – what I basically – in the book, I call it the new energy climate consensus and I think basically the, the cheapest and best way to address it is to try to mobilize uh, human technical ingenuity to figure out how to make low carbon and no carbon uh, energy supplies. And uh, that would require a bit of government research. But the – so the research, the kind of uh, investment in new green technologies for the future. It's investment kind of in research. The government just should deploy not a single thing. Okay. It should, it should no, no – it's research and development, not research, development and deployment. The government should be completely out of that. Part of the reason, if I may explain, is during the first energy crisis, I used to be a government regulator. <laughs> I said it. You mean the 70s? I, yes, in the 70s. I worked for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and I was part of the team that was going to solve our energy crisis by, among other things, turning uh, millions of tons of coal into natural gas. And so uh, I was on the team that was regulating the setting up of the uh, Great Plains Coal Gasification Plant in Beulah, North, in Beulah, North Dakota. And we were going to make 20 of those, actually 40, the equivalent of 40 of those. And that was going to uh, solve our natural gas crisis because we were closing down schools and businesses in the winter because we were out of natural gas because we were running out of natural gas. Turns out we were running out of natural gas at a government mandated price of a dollar not out of natural gas. Uh, but I, I just imagine what our carbon footprint would have been had we built those 20 government mandated plants. So the government is not very good at figuring out what we should do Perhaps, and not very good actually at figuring out how to develop new technologies. But uh, it won't be completely wasted. Is this though the fear that – I mean so there's this possibility that global warming will have really bad effects. Um, but there's – government has a track record of let's call them often really bad effects. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and we you, have – You must always ask yourself, is what government is likely to do about global warming more likely to be a problem than global warming? And that is – should always be in the background. I have right. a precautionary principle against government. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm one – I guess the question then is about the funding of research because it tends that research either – comes with strings attached or at least is somewhat guided by its funding. I mean this is the, the yeah. knock that goes against all sorts of – everyone you disagree with who produces research, they're producing research because their corporate overlords told them to. Um, and so if the government is funding research, then the chances are it's going to produce exactly those results the government wants, which will likely be the ones that will say the government should either spend more money or get more involved. I, I don't know that it does that so much with technologies. I'm trying to figure out – though we should always keep in mind if you if you are worried about government subsidizing uh, energy technologies and I, I particularly would like our environmental friends to think about this. The one technology, the, gov the one power source the government subsidized into existence was? Nuclear. Nuclear power. And how does the environmental community like that? that they are not a big fan, which I've never understood. Good, exactly. But, but the point is is that um, we, we want to, to avoid a thing like Solyndra where you're basically subsidizing a manufacturing plant. What you want to do is for somebody to figure out how to make a solar cell 40 percent efficient as opposed to 20 percent efficient and then see if some company will find that useful to do. And that will be much cheaper than wasting tons of money on deployments like coal gasification or Solyndra. So – and I think that would be – it's an insurance policy. And it, would, and it wouldn't cost the taxpayers that much. I know it's controversial. 
But considering the other schemes, for example, what the EPA is planning to do with the clean power plan and regulating coal-fired plants in the United States, my little research plan is a lot cheaper and you might get a lot more bang for the buck. I can't, I can't guarantee it. Government is a failure in many ways. On the question of nuclear power, which is which is a vexing uh, opposition the environmental movement has had against it, it and that has always made me think that it, that it seems like they want a perfect energy source. They, they're not really th thinking about trade-offs. There's no, some they, sort of sanctity the thing, of the yes. environment that they're – why is the opposition to nuclear power? Was it before Chernobyl? Was it strong or was it kind of a Chernobyl thing and now we have the Fukushima and so they're probably not going to come around still? Right. It, it started uh, early on but uh, uh, Chernobyl and, and Three Mile Island certainly didn't help. The, uh, the good news right now is, is that, for, uh, for example, some of the more catastrophic uh, – the people who are more worried about catastrophic climate change, someone like James Hansen who was one of the first people to argue that catastrophic climate change was going to happen or Ken Caldera or, or Carrie Emanuel at MIT, uh, they actually had an open letter last year saying we have to – there's no path to a clean energy future without nuclear. We have to have nuclear power. And I do see some portions of the at least environmental elite changing their mind on that. Uh, now, I, I have friends tell me when I mention that 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 they're one of the reasons they're opposed to that is because really they they don't want to give people more uh, consumables. They don't. Want, you're just uh, you're just encouraging people to suck more and more from the environment and just consume and consume and consume. Well, then they should just say that as opposed to bring up bogus fears about science behind nuclear power. Vastly, vastly, vastly more people have died uh, producing uh, coal-powered energy than anyone's died producing nuclear energy. Um, but the, the great news is there are all these other fabulous new designs out there that I don't see how we're going to get past the regulators right now unless someone feels like there's a crisis. Uh, the traveling wave reactor, which has been designed by TerraPower, which is a uh, 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 Nathan Mirvold, Mirvold of uh, Microsoft is a supporter, basically uses nuclear waste to create essentially a nuclear battery. And I won't go into the technical de details of it, but you could fuel it and it will run for 50 years. OK? You don't have to do anything. And when, you, when it's done, the, uh, the isotopes that are left over uh, are much less radioactive than the current nuclear fuels that we have. So you don't need to store it forever like we do now. It would be a wonderful design. Unfortunately, our regulators are going, we don't have enough people to evaluate this. We need more money, more power. I, anyway, that typical story. But it, assuming something like that worked, and I think that there's good evidence that it might, um, Mirvold has argued that we have already mined as much uranium as we'll need to supply everyone on planet Earth with as much electricity as Americans use today for a thousand years. Just going back and using our nuclear waste that has been stored, and why don't we try that? So would that be a sort of good libertarian position to have on global warming? Is is the government is doing too much to subsidize fossil fuels, probably, and doing too much to retard right. the innovation of other types of of clean technology? Choosing winners like Solyndra, putting money in the wrong place, so we, we're not getting innovation. A in very the good insight. Segment. Yes, yes. That, so I that's, think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, it, it, and it is a problem uh, again because as I say, we're trying to pick the winners of coal gasification and I hate to think of it. Here's another thing to think about it is – and I've looked at this ages ago. Uh, one of my favorite articles and I never got much traction. Anyway, was – We'll uh, put a link up in the show notes. Okay, it was uh, uh, back in, in 19 uh, – in the 1970s, the National Academy of Sciences got a, uh, nearly a thousand of the smartest scientists together and asked them to figure out what the energy future of America would look like in the year 2010. OK? So I went back and reread that report and what it, we were going to have a thousand nuclear power plants, a thousand, believe it or not. How many do we have now? We have a hundred. This is under a hundred now. And if you think about it, if we had a thousand nuclear power plants, how much lower our carbon output would be now compared to what it is? It's, it's, it's amazing. We were going to – and 200 of them were going to be fast breeder reactors, which means they made more fuel than they burned and they could supply the other reactors as well. That would have been a completely different world than the world we live in and far less carbon intensive. 
but that was killed off by the environmental movement of the time. Um, and uh, it's really strongly against that. And so they have now put us in a world with a higher carbon world than we would otherwise have had. Thank you, environmental movement. Then is there anywhere that the environmental movement comes out ahead? Anything, any issue they're on where they're not only probably right but also have probably at least in the right direction solution or aren't doing more harm than good? Well, it would be rude of me to say no. <laughs> well, maybe you know, trying to preserve certain animals like, no, I, I, like, no, like let's whale, go, whaling. Let's, and well, let's go like to the extinction crisis for example. Uh, it again is an example of, of, uh, of, of something happening in, in open access commons. No one owns the animals and therefore no one protects them. And uh, one of the and, and I think extinction is forever, and it is a problem uh, that we need to take care of. Again, the, the top-down solutions they've been offering, uh, the, the, the Endangered Species Act, for example, has not been super successful, though it has not been a complete failure either in being able to preserve species and protect them. Very expensive, very litigious. There are better ways to do it. But one one of the things I, I do have a chapter uh, on uh, whether the ark is sinking is the way I put the question, and there's a lot of I, a lot of good news I think is is uh, let me give you a couple of trends. One is I mentioned earlier peak farmland, as as uh, agricultural productivity goes up, using among other things genetically modified crops, we'll use less land. Uh, as we move to plantation forestry, we'll use less forest land. In fact, there was a new report out just this week, not obviously included in the book by the Food and Agriculture Organization, so, uh, showing that deforesta- the global deforestation rate is, has been dropped in half over the last 25 years. We're going to, if you will, p- nadir forest. We're going to be growing back uh, in the next couple of decades or so. The other thing that's great is urbanization trends. Um, more people are moving to cities. For the last uh, five or six years, for the first time, more people live in cities than not ever. And that's going to probably go to 80 percent by 2050, 2060, there's about. If that is the case, we will have – with a world population of 9 billion people, say, we will have less than half the number of people living on the landscape than we have now. Instead of 3.6 million billion people living on the landscape, basically subsistence farmers and what have you, there will only be 1.8 billion people living on the landscape. That also has a very good, big effect uh, on the possibilities of sustaining species over time. Do you think that books like yours, uh, which again I commend to our listeners, it's very good. It's the end of doom, environmental renewal in the 21st century. You can't have too many copies. That's true, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think they change people's minds or do you find that, that – this sort of cataclysmic. Are you trying to depress me? <laughs> I, I just, it's uh, it, it's it's so embedded. I mean, we were talking before the show started about how much I you know learned this stuff growing up, and how much I was told that everything's going to work just like you. And I, and I don't think that that message has changed much, even though there's been a lot of research how it's not the case. Um, it's it's just a firmly embedded thing that the cataclysm is coming in the environmental sense. So uh, it, it, does it? Do you get down every now and then that like the no. world's mind is changing? <laughs> um, no. To a certain extent, I understand what you're saying. Yes, uh, there, there's this per- perpetual meme. Uh, another quick story if I may. My first book was called Eco Scam, uh, The False Prophets of Ecological Apocalypse, which is the one I was describing a bit earlier. And when I was signing the contract for that book, uh, my editor turned to me and said, Ron, we're going to make some money with this book. It's a good book. No problem. We, and we did make some money. But he did say – but I want to tell you right now, if you had brought me a book saying the world was coming to an end, I could have made you a rich man. And you're right. Doom sells. It always will sell. I mean news, news is things that don't go right. The fact of the matter is for almost all Americans, 99.9 percent of the time, things go right. And when things go wrong, that's when you hear about it. And so you, by hearing about it, 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 it distorts your sense of reality. You think things are a lot worse than they are. I would like to assure your listeners things are much better than the newspapers portray them as being. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughts, P-O-D. FreeThoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.